Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Frank Schirmeister, who's going to talk about changes in verification based upon what's changing on the application side and also on the system-level design side. Frank, we've seen a lot of changes over the past 15 years. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more changes over the next 15 years. What, what are you seeing? What do you think is going to change in the future, and what's driving it? Okay, two things. System integration, we will continue to drive towards more pieces integrated, and then there is the notion of distribution. We have more and more devices talking to each other. To illustrate this, um, Thule being in Silicon Valley as a mega geek, um, this is what I had 15 years ago, 2002, my iPad. It was, uh, for me at the time, I added a camera, so that one flips on top of here didn't have the finger recognition, so I had a stylus, I had a keyboard. Then I had a GPS, <laughs> believe it or not, put that onto the dashboard. I had my iPod because I need to have my music while on travel. And then I had two phones, one for the US, one for Europe, because they weren't really that well multinational, right? Did so you used to carry those around in a backpack? Yeah, I had a little, my backpack was heavier at the time, right? Because now what's happening, it's all here. I have it all in my handy dandy iPhone and a lot more, right? So it has been, this has been all integrated. That's the first trend. So the second trend is the distribution of more devices talking to each other. I have my um, tracker here. We use this for a while. That's really small and needs to be really cheap. So it should be given away. At night, I'm wearing my Fitbit to do my through the night sleep tracking. And of course, I have my handy dandy smartphone. So there are more devices now talking to it, to the network I have at home. I can easily look into my house with the cameras, with the motion sensors and so forth. So two trends, more things even more integrated and uh, more items talking to each other. And more problems, too, because now you have to worry about things like security, which you didn't in the past, right? Well, we always um, were worried about security um, in the past as well, but not as much as we are now. So um, if somebody can hack into this and hack into my phone, hack into my network, that's um, a problem uh, even in the consumer domain, I see. It always was an issue already in health and so forth that you needed to for sensors you had that those needed to be very robust and uh, tested for safety and all that. But uh, security definitely has um, new uh, dimensions now, especially as you take into consideration the architecture of the overall network. So when you're designing these and also verifying them, is security starting to creep into that piece of the world? Um, in the past when we've done verification, it's pretty much been functional. That's the definition of verification more or less. Are we starting to now think of security as part of the function? Yeah, two things, security and safety, um, are really part of the items to be verified, right? So it's, um, it's not only the functional verification, does the device actually do what it's supposed to do? And then do I actually know that it's not allowing to do any things I don't want it to do? That's kind of the security aspect, that I don't want somebody to be able to hack into it. But it's not really part of the functional verification today. That's a big issue. Uh, being dealt with. And then in the same context, there's a whole notion of safety. What does my uh, device do when I um, when there's a failure? Does it actually go into a safe state? That's why functional safety is a big item. And that's becoming much more important as we move into automotive, medical, and industrial with a lot of these designs, right? Exactly, exactly. And uh, it, it goes through the, the whole gambit of verification tools from formal trying to figure out which one are your false negatives through simulation where you have fault simulation extending into um, functional safety execution. Um, and that extends further into emulation because you need to figure out, for example, how your software safely gets into a safe state once a, a fault occurred. And you can do this with emulation, FPGA-based prototyping to figure out are there actually the right levels of degradation uh, when a fault occurs and uh, does my system go back into a safe state. As we start building more functionality into these designs, as we start uh, being able to do things more with them, more connectivity, uh, splitting up what you're talking about between multiple devices, 
What happens in terms of the ease of design? It's becoming much more complicated. You've got heterogeneity in there. Uh, even within a single device, you no longer just have a processor, you now have multiple processors. So I think there's real bifurcation happening. Um, you have the integration of this pile of devices I had in 2005, and that's going all into um, uh, one device, and there's more moving into those, right? So I was debating with me half a year ago, well, which sensors will be in the next phones. Well, I now know they know a 3D rendering of my face and all that. And who knows what's next, right? There are more sensors, which I didn't even think of, which will go into the phone itself, into the, the hub, if you will. Uh, but then um, there's also the question of how to build the overall architecture of the network in, uh, from an energy perspective. You can really can't just move all the data in the cloud calculated and then go back into the device um, to look at the results. You have to have processing throughout the way and that's a, uh, a big um, architecture issue. In terms of design and ease of design, well there's a question um, from a bifurcation perspective into the really big designs with all the integration as I mentioned, but then for my small design, if I have this little tracker, do I really want to do a chip design for it? Um, do I do a chiplet thing with uh, pre-assembled chip pieces or do I use a microcontroller, right? And then the whole question comes in with what happens, in to, happens to licensing cost and so forth. And you have on one end, you have established technologies with the Design Start initiative from ARM, for example, and our cloud um, activity around this in the hosted design system. And on the other hand, you have, um, when it comes to licensing costs, things like Risk V um, and so forth. And that's really a battle of the ecosystems, if you will, going on between uh, the different processor architecture. And architecture is one of the big uh, changes that's gone on here. In the past, we were simply using whatever was off the shelf. Now we're designing all these components from scratch and how they uh, play together. How do we um, verify, uh, plan for this stuff, um, and how far does that have to move further left into the architecture stage? Well, um, it's, it's really kind of probably causing a resurgence of what we used to think was important as uh, system level design tools um, 20, 15, 20 years ago, right? The ESL piece. But this is system level design on a much bigger level, right? Correct. The scope of the system has expanded, right? So I have my sea of things here. I have, um, today I have hubs um, like my phone, like um, my car, like my house and that all goes into the servers up here um, where all the computation happens, right? And then you have in there the whole notion of um, the whole big data piece, right? So analyzing what's going on here and everything is connected by way of networking. So now the architecture, if you want to verify all that, it's not trivial at all, right? So you need to figure out, for example, if I do my cell phone chip design here, I need to verify that it runs in the right networks. So things like 5G will play big here, um, because then 5G might actually go directly from here into the network and bypassing some of the hubs in the gateways. I need to figure out, well, what happens if a thousand things um, uh, instantiate because a train gets into the area. So those are systems at a much bigger scope than we used to have. And as we move into the 5G world, that becomes a problem in and of itself because now you have a very high frequency which gets absorbed by objects. So now you need more of these devices and you need to be able to manage more of these in your verification, right? Exactly. And, and so that's why today, for example, when you look at verification, verification becomes much more application specific, right? In the terms of um, uh, in terms of 5G, for example, I do have things like TCAM and so forth, which are really um, um, really well done in our emulator, for example. You have to deal with new forms of Ethernet. So the verification requirements to verify all those channels go up in terms of capacity bandwidth, what you need to verify. 
so that and that's just networking right so now if I um, uh, go into others if I look into automotive now I really have uh, things like functional safety to deal with and and um, add other applications like medical and so forth where the requirements again change quite a bit what happens when we move into advanced packaging? So that's starting to roll out here as well. We're starting to put a lot of these components into these uh, um, systems. How does that affect what we're doing both in terms of the design and also in terms of the verification? Well, from a verification perspective, what you need to look at is really the multi-domain execution, right? If I verify such a system, in order to, um, to have all of it running together, you really need to have a very heterogeneous environment set up to be able to do that. It would really be nice if I have the RTL for everything, right? If I have the RTL for all the things, for let's say I'm developing this chip for all the hubs or I'm developing the, the server chip with some um, domain optimization for specific workloads, it would be nice to have all the RTL and then I'm happy to provide you with an array of emulators to emulate all that. Well. Reality is that won't happen uh, in terms of having all of it available. So you have different levels. You have things at the TLM system lo level. Uh, those are the things which are not available yet. You have RTL for components. Those you can easily map into emulation um, and simulation. And then you also have the real chip for some cases, right? Some cases may uh, use components which I don't actually have um, available as RTL and then on top of it you have um, domain specific things right so um, with domain here I mean um, things like the whole mechanical piece where you go beyond just the digital simulation you have analog you have um, um, you have uh, electromechanical and so forth so in order to put all this together you need to uh, put together really very specific um, uh, multi-domain execution environments for verification. From the chip design and uh, verification side, what has to change in terms of the mindset of the engineer as well? Well, there are two, uh, uh, two aspects to mindset. One is the user uh, mindset, and then there's the designer as, uh, and the, the, the company, the business mindset, if you will. So my, I use always my dad as a litmus test, if you will. Um, will he, going on 80 and so forth, will he actually adopt the technology still in a generation ahead of me? And I'm happy to report he has completely abandoned his PC, he's, he's gone totally tablet. He has a cochlear implant, so he has mechanical pieces which need to connect uh, to the network. But his mindset would be that he would not want to have all his data from the phone, for example, be easily accessible or part of a breach potentially, right? My daughter, on the other hand, may have some complete different concerns as an uh, almost 13-year-old. She is, um, they have a different mindset in terms of adopting these uh, technologies and it really comes down to the application domain, right? In medical, you may not have another chance uh, because it might be life enabling or life enhancing like a hearing aid or things around the heart and, and things around measuring uh, data. In other domains like consumer, you may decide, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going completely dark, and I don't want to be connected, right? So that's the user mindset, the, which will impact adoption in the different application domains. And then the funny thing on the business side is actually there's a question of monetization, right? So where do I get the dollar from? Well, the big dollar is here, as a user, and I need to be able to potentially look at this in a more systemic way. Good example, um, my, my um, uh, sleep tracker, I had an older one for a while. Um, this came for free, but then the real value is for them in, or came at a very low price, there was no subscription or anything. But then you can get a subscription giving you health advice. You can um, use, they can use these data to potentially send you information about sleep related things. Do I need a CPAC and, and things like that? Um, or what happens from a heart time link perspective? So monetization 
may completely change because you may have to give this away, the, the thing especially, the, the sensor, to be able to monetize in, in other areas of the design. So that's where the mindset of the developer has to change. And your sample size on medical things has changed and grown dramatically over what it was in the past because in the past it was typically who's involved in this particular group, now we're doing worldwide potentially. Exactly, worldwide and potentially directly connected, right? So today, um, things will, a medical device will connect to some level of help. You download data either on your PC, send it out, or you go to the doctor once a month and there's enough storage for um, a month plus buffer in the device and the doctor reads it out, right, or the, um, your medical provider. Well, with 5G, five years from now, um, uh, these things may be able to um, connect directly uh, back into the network, which uh, goes back then to the other questions we we asked, right? So the whole question of security becomes a big one, right? Because obviously, if so now somebody hacks into this, if I can remote operate a device, um, and then you, you have all kinds of interesting aspects. Uh, security is one. There's for the consumer much more uh, much more. Uh, tangible uh, individual items which might happen, right? So for example, um, you don't want to pay the full price for your healthcare device, um, for um, your audio equipment, for example. Well, you can pay half and we'll give you advertisements on the hour, and which may be annoying, but uh, it, it, from a health perspective, those things might, might happen, right? That you have these um, value compensations. Frank Schermeister, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.